The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12535. In the name of Claire Adamson on the Scottish Fire Sprinkler Coordination Group. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would also invite the members who are leaving the debating chamber and indeed members of the public who are leaving the debating chamber to do so quickly and quietly. And I now call on Claire Adamson to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking my colleagues from across the chamber and for those taking part in the de debate today for their support for the motion. Can I also welcome to the gallery today members of the Fire Sprinkler Coordination Group, which includes European Fire Sprinkler Network, the National Fire Sprinkler Network, Chief Fire Officers Association, and members of the insurance industry and those from care organisations. Founding members of that group, the British Automatic Fire Sprinkler Association, are hosting a lunchtime event, which I hope members will also be able to attend. But I have to say, presiding officer, somewhat ironically, this event is being held in the Burns Room, so perhaps, given the topic today, the less said about that, the better. Presiding officer, no one can forget the tragic deaths at the Rose Park Care Home in Uddingston in January 2014 that resulted in the death of 14 residents. Sheriff Principal Lockhart's finding at the time after the fatal accident inquiry into the fire, which particularly looked at the, the cause of death, um, said that they could have been prevented if the home had had a suitable and sufficient fire safety plan, something that I trust would not happen today, given that the Scottish Government have published their practical fire safety guidance for care homes in March 2014. And there is no doubt that Scotland has made significant progress in the area of fire safety, prevention and in the use of one of the best protection mechanisms, fire sprinkler systems. I'd like to pay tribute to Michael Matheson, whose private members bill, Fire Sprinklers and Residential Premises Scotland bill, paved the way for um, the significant progress that has been made in Scotland. The Scottish Government commissioned the Scotland Together report in 2009, which included, concluded that the installation of sprinklers in all Scottish homes was not cost effective. More recent evidence, including the new UK cost-benefit analysis for the British Research Establishment, does not challenge that underlying conclusion. But BRE have gone on to say that residential sprinklers, as an additional safety measure, are cost-effective for all residential care homes, elderly children and disabled people, most blocks of purpose-built flats and larger blocks of converted flats, and traditional bedside-type HMOs, with at least six bedside units per building. Residential sprinklers in two-storey houses that are shared did not meet their, their cost analysis. We in this place recognise that we cannot make decisions without cognizance of cost. However, presiding officer, we should always still be asking the question of what cost is a human life, whether that be a resident, a staff member, or indeed a firefighter, where the dangers to the firefighter are considerably less when they're attending a fire in a property that is fitted with a sprinkler system. In May 2005, the Scottish Government led the rest of the UK by introducing new banditary building standards requiring the installation of sprinklers in all new build enclosed shopping centres, residential care buildings, care homes and boarding schools and sheltered housing complications and in high-rise domestic buildings. The installation of sprinkler systems in all new build dwells such as houses was not justified at that time in cost grounds. But we know the Welsh Government, for instance, has taken the decision to install sprinklers in all new build domestic properties. In October 2010, the revised building regulations introduced sprinklers into the domestic handbook guidance as an option to protect common escape routes in low-rise domestic buildings. Sprinklers were also introduced in new primary and secondary schools to support sustainable development by providing enhanced property protection against fire. I'm sure the Minister will touch on some of these areas in his own contribution this afternoon. But in terms of affordable housing, Scotland Together found in 2009 that, that social deprivation links had an increased risk of fire fatality, with 40% of accidental dwelling and fire deaths occurring within social rented housing and 31% in Scottish index of multiple deprivation. 
15% in the most deprived areas. And therefore, a targeted approach was, was insta in, of installation in social rented council and housing association owned dwellings was rolled out across Scotland. But I know that particular councils in Scotland, such as Fife and Angus councils, are installing sprinkles in all new built council properties. It's a no-brainer to them to protect not just the residents, but also their financial investment in the new properties. As the chair of the cross-party group on accident prevention and safety awareness, one of the biggest challenges that we have to overcome in the area of fire sprinkler use is the normalisation within our communities of their use. The very fact that both the Scottish Fire and Rescue and BAFSA have myth-busting sections on their websites tells us that the safety advantage, the protection of fire and f of property, protection of life, and, and the protection of our fire officers in attending these fires should be at the form, forefront of our discussions, but we're still talking about the myths surrounding fire sprinklers. If I could quote the BF, uh, BAFSA on, from their own website, that they say one of the biggest myths is that they're expensive and difficult to fit into existing buildings and thus rarely practical to fit them after initial construction. In order to determine the truth of this, BAFSA funded a pilot project to install sprinklers in a Sheffield Tower block. The project proved conclusively that it is possible and cost-effective to retrofit sprinklers into existing high-rise blocks without having to first relocate the tenants or have any major disruption. Some of the other myths are that installations can't be done on a fast-track basis, which has been proven not to be true. The cost as well, but the actual installation cost of per flat is about £1,150. And given the effectiveness and both protection of the investment in the property and also always at the forefront the protection of life, I think this is a, a, a reasonable cost um, analysis. Tenants and residents and their families feel safer knowing that they're better protected living in a building with a sprinkler system in place. We also know that the potential trauma and disruptions to individuals following a fire is greatly reduced because the um, damage from a fire in these types of buildings is very, very much restricted. So retrofit spitting and sprinklers can be a major refurbishment project. It can be done reasonably, it can be done without major disruption, and it can be done um, to meet current building standards. I know many care homes and residential properties built and in operation were before these new building standards. I would hope that the message of retrofitting is fully understood and that raising awareness of retrofitting may prompt action to ensure that the very best form of preventative fire protection in the form of sprinklers can be extended to the whole community in Scotland. Thank you, Thank you very much. I now call on David Stewart to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Four minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Could I start by congratulating Claire Adamson for securing the debate today and for her work as convener of the Cross-Party Group on Accident Prevention. I also welcome the Scottish Fire Sprinkler Coronation Group to Parliament today and hope they have a successful event. I've had a long-standing interest in the vital role of fire sprinkler systems as a preventative device in fire safety. And I want to place on record today the help I received from Councillor Fraser Power of Highland Council and his former colleagues from the Highlands Islands Fire and Rescue Service for their advice, guidance and assistance. In the last session, I worked up a proposal as a Members' Bill which would have had the effect of ensuring that all new HMOs um, have fire sprinkler systems. And fortunately, I ran out of time as I also had a proposal on dangerous and effective buildings. However, I am pleased to report uh, to Parliament that latter bill was approved unanimously by Parliament and again thanks to Minister Derek Mackay for his help. I suppose, President Officer, in simplistic terms, prevention is always better than a cure. And that's why I think it's important that we consider other ways we can prevent deaths and injuries caused by fire. And I commend the efforts of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in undertaking various preventative uh, programmes, including the home fire safety visits. And welcome, as Claire Addison has said, the revision to the building regulations in 2010 that made at least one smoke alarm mandatory. This has contributed to more smoke and heat alarms being fitted in homes. Uh, last April, the previous minister 
uh, Rosanna Cunningham, wrote to me, and I quote, it's estimated that installing smoke alarms in dwellings could reduce the risk of death to about 30 to 50% of the risk where there's no alarms. And in terms of affordable housing, and again, Claire Addison touched on this, the Scottish Together study said that social deprivation links to the increased risk uh, with 40% of accidental dwelling fires occurring within socially rented housing and 31% in the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation Most Deprived Areas, unquote. However, uh, more can be done, and that's why I've been advocating the introduction of fire sprinkler systems in all social housing and HMOs. It's clear from evidence that fire sprinklers can save lives and if targeted well, can help protect the most vulnerable people in our society. And fire sprinkler systems are a highly cost-effective way of reducing the UK's appalling fire death toll. Currently, fire detection systems and smoke alarms probably save around 80 to 100 lives each year. And of course, it is the most vulnerable members of our society who are most at risk. The very young, the very old, the disabled, the infirm and those, of course, who abuse drugs and alcohol. And sprinklers, of course, can actually prevent fire deaths. And in the case of social housing, residential care premises, homes in multiple occupation, hostels and similar properties, there are clear arguments that sprinklers offer the best chance of preventing deaths should a fire occur. And the most comprehensive study that I could find on the effectiveness of residential sprinklers was carried out by the Rural Metro Fire Department in Scottsdale, Arizona. It showed that not only did they save lives, but also significantly reduced the cost of damage caused by an average of 85%. And I'm very pleased, and again, Clarison touched on this, that both Fife and Angus councils have really showed us the way by ensuring that all new social housing will have systems built in, and I hope that more councils across Scotland should follow suit. The Welsh Assembly, have gone, of course, has gone even further and has passed groundbreaking legislation ensuring that all new homes should contain fire sprinkler systems from 2016. And I hope that the Scottish Government and the Minister in the wind-up will look at the result in Wales and extend the current requirements to fill the gap. I'm well aware that the Scottish Government has commissioned research into the cost-benefit analysis for residential sprinklers in Scotland. In a previous question, I think last November, the Minister indicated the results would be published in Easter. As the results of search are not available, I certainly couldn't find them, I would be very grateful the Minister could give us an update on the timetable for this research. In conclusion, President Officer, I hope that Scotland will continue to lead the way in fire prevention by considering broadening the requirements of fire sprinkler systems to all social housing and HMO properties to ensure that no lives are lost that could have been prevented. This Parliament has a proud record of innovation and best practice, such as the introduction of free personal care, the smoking ban and the zero tolerance approach to domestic abuse. I believe we are at our best when we are at our boldest. Let's add another groundbreaking policy extend the range of sprinklers to prevent the death and injury of our old, our vulnerable and disadvantaged constituents across Scotland. Thanks very much. I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and let me add my congratulations to uh, Claire Adamson for bringing this important topic uh, to Parliament today. Um, it's uh, an interesting subject. I remember uh, I think about 10 years ago, Stuart Maxwell, MSP, and I uh, went to see a demonstration of a sprinkler system uh, in Hamilton, and we saw a before and after. Uh, we saw a fire without uh, the sprinkler system, and then we saw the very different effect of the same fire uh, when it was operated on by a sprinkler. So I think I was left in no doubt whatsoever about the efficacy of but he's actually quite a cheap intervention. Now, I say cheap intervention, let me defend that. The cost of even retrofitting on average to a house, what's that comparable to? It's comparable to the cost of putting in a new gas boiler. It's comparable to the cost of uh, the next generation of high definition 55 inch televisions, uh, so, which many people uh, choose to buy. It's actually not all that different to uh, the insurance cost for a youngster with a first car, if it's other than a Fiat 500. So the cost ought not to be the immediate barrier to considering doing this. 
Uh, we've heard uh, from Dave Stewart, and I've seen elsewhere, that there are 100 UK deaths. Now, how much is a death worth? And, of course, to the family who experience loss, there is no financial price one can put it on. But the kind of figures that are generally used, if we assume that we save two-thirds of the deaths by having sprinkler systems universally installed, um, then we're looking at a saving against the kind of figures that are put on people's lives that would pay for 13,000 houses a year across the UK, not, not a Scottish figure. Uh, so there is a direct, simple financial relationship. But there are other savings that can be made as well, if you want to be analytical from that point of view. Fewer fires and fewer deaths and reduction in the impact of fires is a saving uh, for the fire and rescue service. It is a saving for the insurance industry. It would reduce premiums. And it's actually for the householder very likely that it will be reflected in an increased value that can be put on the house when it comes up for sale. And when we remember, and this figure is a little out of date, I don't have the current figure, uh, that certainly about five or six years ago, the average mortgage length was only seven years. One can get a sense of how quickly an investment uh, in this sort of thing might happen. Now, simultaneously to thinking about the benefits and the cost benefits that there are from installation of fire sprinkler systems, we should think about where the risks come of household fires. We've seen an increase in the consumption of alcohol in Scotland, and when people are less sensible of their actions, the risks from fire and a range of other risks uh, inevitably rises. So I think that gives further weight to the actions that have received broader support across the Parliament to address the alcohol abuse issue. We've taken great steps, and I give absolute credit again to Jack McConnell for being brave on smoking legislation. We've seen a reduction in the amount of smoking, and that's good. I do, however, have a little niggle in my mind as to whether, with smoking becoming less acceptable in public places, does that mean there may be more smoking in homes uh, where that uh, could potentially be an issue? Um, it's always worth remembering to return to the issue of insurance, uh, and I'm told that uh, representatives of the insurance industry are with us here. Yes, we would expect to see uh, the cost of insurance go down when you've installed the sprinkler system. The sprinkler system itself is a form of insurance, and I think the one saying about insurance we should always remember is insurance is the one product you cannot buy when you really need it. Presiding officer. Thanks very much. Now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate Claire Adamson on bringing this debate to the Chamber today and also pay tribute to the important work she as convener and other members of the cross-party group on accident prevention do, highlighting prevention issues such as the importance of and the need for fire sprinklers. There is no doubt that both the nature and the scale of the Addingston Rose Park Care Home tragedy 10 years ago, where 14 elderly people lost their lives, brought the whole issue of fire prevention measures to the forefront of public consciousness. And indeed, the subsequent findings of the fatal accident inquiry established that this tragedy could have been prevented had suitable measures been taken. The Fire Scotland Act 2005 therefore sought to ensure that fire safety in Scotland's care homes is adequate and it required that fire sprinklers be fitted in new and altered care homes. Furthermore, last year the Scottish Government issued an updated guidance on the Act's application to care homes and this recommends retrofitting sprinklers where there are high dependency residents. Whilst there are obviously costs involved with retrofitting automatic fire sprinklers, the benefits of preventing avoidable damage have been recognised in countries such as those listed in the motion, namely Finland, Norway, Sweden and New Zealand. This is surely because these countries recognise that injury and fatalities in the event of a fire far outweigh any initial cost and this is clearly a sentiment which has been echoed here during this debate in the chamber today. 
The updated guidance also states that fire protection products should be fit for their purpose and properly installed and maintained. And that, where possible, a reputable third-party certification body, which itself has been accredited by the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, should independently check that standards are being met for fire protection products. This is to ensure installation and maintain, maintenance contractors are properly qualified and competent. However, this third-party safety net is not a requirement. And significantly, instead of having one authority with an approved list of fire safety consultants to weed out the cowboy operators, there are numerous professional bodies, in addition to the UK accreditation service, that operate these registration schemes. It is welcome, therefore, that in relation to fire sprinklers, the British Automatic Fire Sprinkler Association act as a hub for companies looking to install sprinkler systems. As a trade association with over 40 years of experience, it is responsible for its members installing over 85% of automatic sprinkler and water mist systems within the UK. The, the association also has led the way in campaigning for the retrofitting of sprinklers in residential care homes, schools, high-rise buildings and historic buildings. Presiding officer, this is a record to be proud of, which is why today's debate provides a welcome opportunity to acknowledge the British Automatic Fire Sprinkler Association's achievements, as well as helping to raise awareness about both the benefits and the need to install fire sprinklers. Many thanks. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm, after which we'll move the closing speech. Uh, presiding Mr. Officer, um, I uh, congratulate uh, Claire Adamson for uh, introducing this debate today and also for bringing the Parliament's attention to today's awareness raising event on the importance of protecting people and properties from the threat of fire. When the fire uh, sprinklers in residential premises bill was introduced in 2003, there was no requirement in legislation for the mandatory installation of fire sprinkler systems in residential properties. Primary responsibility for making the choice to install equipment fell to the owner, and whether they chose to inf install fire sprinkler systems was entirely a matter for them to decide. The bill went some way ensuring that in certain types of residential property, retrofitting of fire sprinklers became mandatory. This not only means ensuring that building regulations are met and that retrofitting takes place in existing care homes and sheltered housing, but that the equipment is maintained and checked regularly. In the document Practical Fire Safety Guidance for Care Homes, the Government sets out the steps that should be followed in accordance with the Fire Scotland Act 2005. Any defects which occur should be put right, I'm quoting here, any defects which occur should be put right as quickly as possible, though there may be a need for contingency plans when life safety systems such as fire warning systems or sprinklers are defective. End of quote. A failed sprinkler system could, as we all know, cost lives. When we see disasters, when we remember such disasters as the loss of life at Rose Park Care Home, it is clear that we need to continually reinforce the message that a failure to comply with this legislation can lead to tragic consequences. No person who is placed in the care of a home in Scotland should be left at risk of such a tremendous threat. It is now an offence to occupy sheltered housing when it is known that a completion certificate has not been granted because a fire sprinkler system has not been provided. And like Claire Adamson and others in this chamber, I see this rule as vital in terms of preventing loss of life through fire. This should apply to all buildings where the care of a large number of people takes place. In 2010, the Government's Building Scotland Amendment regulations added school buildings to the existing list of buildings that require a sprinkler system. I would welcome a comment in the wind-up speech from the Minister about the position with regard to schools, because I believe that the uh, Government routinely gives an exemption to schools uh, in terms of sprinkler systems. There may well be a good reason for that, but the situation is not entirely clear to me in relation to schools. Presiding officer, today we're focusing on the need to raise awareness of both the risk of fires in the homes of multiple occupants in our, in our care homes, but also the risks of a failure to take responsibility for ensuring equipment is installed and maintained. 
The coordination group mentioned in the motion works effectively by exchanging information with other coordination groups across the UK on research, campaigning for better recognition of the need for retrofitting, and lobbying for changes to legislation that will ensure installation becomes the rule and not the exception in key types of property. The Chief Fire Officers Association has consistently made the case for wide use of sprinkler systems, stating that their effectiveness has been, and again I quote, proven in use for well over 100 years, during which time they have a 99% success rate worldwide. There are sprinkler systems over 100 years old that are still in full working condition today. Close of quote. I must say I was very surprised when I read that. Believe it or not, automatic sprinkler systems have been incorporated into some buildings since 1872 and were originally seen and developed as a means of reducing fire losses to property and contents. However, over recent years, there has been a growing recognition of their use as a means of contributing to life safety. We all have the right to feel safe in our homes and in situations where that safety cannot be assured by our own actions, since we are in the care of others, that safety can, um, uh, we require the certainty of good legislation to put a duty in place. The Chief Fire Officers Association, in their business case for installation, go on to emphasise that there are no cases on record where multiple fire deaths um, have occurred in buildings with working sprinkler systems, where those systems have been appropriately designed for the intended purpose, and have been properly installed and maintained. Presiding officer, I join Claire Adamson today in welcoming the work of the coordination group in ensuring that the legislation is followed carefully and to the letter. Tragic events like that which we witnessed at Rose Park cannot be forgotten and cannot be allowed to happen again. I support the motion and congratulate Claire Adamson not just for the motion, but for all the work that she does in relation to safety. Many thanks. So we now move to closing speech from the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse. Minister, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to extend my own welcome to the uh, Scottish Fire Sprinkler Coordination Group in the gallery today. I very much want to congratulate Claire Adamson for securing this debate. I know this is an issue that she has referred to me a number of times and she's very passionate about, and for her work indeed on the cross-party group uh, itself. Um, I think it's important that we, we note today the speeches have been very thoughtful. It's been very helpful to me in terms of informative speeches that, that give me the perspective of members and also um, deal with some of the, the cost parameters and some of the considerations in terms of the types of buildings that we, we use. But they have been very interesting and informative. And I'm sorry, uh, unfortunately, genuinely sorry, unfortunately, due to uh, pre-existing diary commitment, I'm unable to attend the, uh, the, the Coordination Group's awareness raising event at lunchtime. But I wish them well and I hope it's uh, well attended by members across the chamber. Presiding officer, as Claire Adamson stated, last year marked the 10th anniversary of the very tragic events at uh, Rose Park Care Home. And I would like to add my own thoughts are with the family and friends of those whose lives were lost. And I'm sure that's uh, something that all members have reflected on today. And it is very poignant to discuss this issue in the context of tragic loss of life that has occurred. But following the tragedy at Rose Park, as a number of members, including uh, Claire Adamson and others have, have mentioned, Scotland has, we believe, led the way uh, in the UK in responding to the tragic events and its implications. And in 2005, we were the first to introduce building standards uh, requiring the installation of sprinklers in the new build care homes and sheltered housing, as well as enclosed shopping centres and high-rise accommodation a number of members, including Margaret Mitchell and others, have referred to. With regard to care homes, it is worth bearing in mind that the SFRS will audit all care home, uh, school care accommodation and secure accommodation services registered with the Care Inspectorate on an annual basis, regardless of whether sprinklers are fitted or not. Uh, it's worth stating that the Fire and Rescue Service's aim is to enable compliance for all care homes to deliver um, on, on compliance and to work with the occupiers and other responsible persons to achieve a satisfactory level of safety for all residents of care homes. But in terms of the uh, enforcement perspective, um, I think it's just worth noting that uh, in, in, in passing that you know, the procedures are, are robust. So we're looking at uh, the, the responsible persons delivering on fire safety in a number of ways, which may include sprinklers in some cases, but also other measures. And uh, where dangerous conditions are, are found, uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, are of the opinion that use of premises involves or will involve a risk to persons in case of fire so serious that the use of the premises ought to be prohibited or restricted, uh, that, that risk cannot be remedied immediately. The service will um, issue a prohibition notice. Can I just finish the point now? We'll bring, bring David Stewart in, uh, or restricting the use of those premises. So that's important to put on record that the failure to comply with any alterations that are suggested, a pro prohibition or enforcement notice, 
constitutes an offence and may result in prosecution of the person responsible. I can bring in Dave Stewart at this point. Dave Stewart. The Minister may be going to touch on this in a second, but in case he does not, could I just ask a specific question about the installation of sprinkler systems in social housing for a new build? We have heard about Angus and Fife, and I congratulate them, but government could put a requirement on all local authorities for this to be carried out. Would the Minister consider looking at that and sharing the experience of Wales that comes in next year? They have clearly done an appraisal on this. Let us look at best practice and, as Stuart Stevenson said, looks at the best practice we've done in the past, like the smoking ban. This could be a great achievement, which all parliamentarians could rally round. Minister. Well, I, I certainly note the consensual tone of the debate today, and that has, that has registered with me. Um, I will come to the, the issue of the research and, and the work we are doing in terms of social housing uh, shortly. But if I can refer briefly just to the point about Wales, uh, Dave Stewart has mentioned it, and other colleagues mentioned it, Claire Adamson as well. In relation to that, we will continue to keep this very important issue under review. We are studying closely what is happening in Wales. I'm obviously very interested in the experience that is, is ex experienced in Wales, uh, and we'll keep in touch with the UK and, and Welsh governments on their experience and try and learn from that. So I certainly uh, give an assurance to, to all members here today that um, we will study closely what happens in Wales, and we'll take a considered view of that. But if we can just carry on with the uh, speech, hopefully I will pick on the points that Dave Stewart mentioned. Um, with uh, regard to care, uh, I've touched on the, the regulation aspects of it, but clearly we want to protect all residents of care homes. But the 2009 Scottish Community Fire Safety Study report, Scotland Together, which members have referred to, concluded that installation of sprinklers in all new Scottish homes would be, uh, not be cost effective. This was borne out by Scottish Government Commission research as well. It was recognised, however, that particular sectors of our communities, uh, for example, people living in deprived areas, a number of members have referred to, who are faced by multiple deprivation, the higher risk factors that Stuart Stevens and others have referred to as well, in terms of uh, drug and alcohol uh, issues. Um, these people are disproportionately affected by fire risk, and it is clear that we have to do more to prevent fires in those areas. So as a result of this, a targeted approach to sprinkler installation for social rented council or housing association owned dwellings has been adopted by some providers, as noted by members in Angus and Fife, and they now require sprinkler systems to be installed in all new build domestic properties commissioned by them. And the Scottish Government supports this targeted approach um, based on cost benefit evidence and robust risk assessment across a range of risk reduction initiatives, including sprinklers. And we continue to keep, as I say, this, this important issue under review. Last year, we did commission uh, research into cost-benefit analysis for the installation of fire suppression systems in new-build houses, flats, houses in multiple occupation, and halls of residence. And the report from that research is due to be published very soon, uh, and we will carefully review the research findings, keep members informed of, of our views, of course, with a view to seeing what practical cost-effective measures might be considered in future uh, in Scotland. Sprinklers are, of course, only one of a range of risk reduction measures that can be deployed to reduce fire deaths. David Stewart and indeed, I think, uh, Stuart Stevenson referred to, to others, including smoke alarms. And the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has been working hard to raise awareness of the risk of fire in the home and encourage people to take action to make their communities safer. This is particularly important as dwelling fires have been the main cause of casualties from fires in Scotland for the last 10 years. And that's why installing smoke alarms remains a key part of the fire prevention activity in domestic premises. And last year, SFRS carried out over 70,000 home fire safety visits that, that David Stewart referred to and installed a total of 60,000 smoke alarms, uh, which I hope members agree is a very positive contribution to tackling fire safety in those premises. And this approach is working. There were 9% fewer dwelling fires in 2013-14 than in the previous year continuing the downward trend of the last decade. And I agree with David Stewart uh, that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and all firefighters and their support staff involved in prevention work of this nature deserve our thanks for their tremendous work on our behalf. From what we have heard here today, there can be no doubt that sprinklers are an effective way to prevent casualties and in particular to limit damage to property caused by fire. I was in interested in the points that Stuart Stevenson was making regarding the, the balance in insurance costs and whether it actually might be an insurance in its own right. But indeed, the SFRS itself plays an active role in promoting the benefits of installing sprinklers among Scotland's business community and joined with uh, fire services across the UK in supporting Fire Sprinkler Week 2015, which took place in March this year. But from a legislative point of view, requirements placed upon the duty holders of relevant premises under the Fire Scotland Act 2005 that Margaret Mitchell referred to are not prescriptive and with good reason. Uh, the Act requires duty holders to carry out an assessment to identify the risks and to decide which reasonable fire safety measures uh, to, to take to ensure the safety of people in those premises. But I do note the points I made earlier about the enforcement uh, where there is a, a perceived to be a significant risk that Fire and Rescue Service can intervene. 
In some environments, uh, installing a sprinkler, sprinkler system may be appropriate and indeed a very cost-effective way of tackling the issue, but in others, alternative methods of risk uh, reduction might be more appropriate and more cost-effective and indeed more effective in absolute terms. So having said that, I would certainly encourage that any business owner carefully considering the installation of a sprinkler system among a range of other risk reduction, uh, reduction initiatives when they are considering the safety of the people using their premises as well as the preservation of their property. But I once again congratulate Claire Adamson on bringing forward this debate today, Presiding Officer. I thank all members for their considered and, and sincere points they have made. And maybe just in closing, just um, say in regards to schools, which I know Malcolm Chisholm raised, um, is something that I'm very much aware of. And the requirement for automatic sprinkler systems in schools uh, was introduced in 2010, new schools, sorry, in 2010. But I will I'll certainly take on board the points he made about that in regard to existing schools as well. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And thank you, Minister, and thank you all. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30.
Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 13160 in the name of Bruce Crawford on New Pairs for Scotland, an interim report on the Smith Commission and the UK Government's proposals. Members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak by now. And I call on Bruce Crawford to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. Sign officer, the Devolution Further Powers Committee was established in October last year. Its task to scrutinise proposals for further devolution arising out of the recommendations of the Smith Commission. It is our interim report published last week that we are here to debate today. This is the committee's initial view of the proposals thus far. Across the committee, we believe a report to be constructive, balanced and objective. We may differ across the committee on the powers we consider the Scottish Parliament should have, but what is clear is that we, seek, we speak with a common voice in saying that, as a minimum, the spirit and substance of the Smith Commission recommendations must be delivered in full, in legislative terms and in the actions of both governments. Our conclusion was that, in significant areas, the draft clauses published in January by the previous UK Government unfortunately do not meet that objective. The committee has called on the new UK Government to seriously consider the areas which we have highlighted, which we believe the draft clauses fall short in. The UK Government must ensure that the Bill, expected to be published next week, is strengthened to fully deliver on the Smith recommendations. As a committee, we set ourselves for very clear and specific tasks in scrutinising proposals for further devolution. Firstly, to assess whether the draft legislative clauses published by the UK Government implemented the Smith Commission recommendations. Secondly, to engage as widely as possible with stakeholders, communities and individuals. Thirdly, to obtain as wide a range of expert opinion as possible within the time frame available. And lastly, to publish a report which should seek to influence the content and development of a new Scotland Bill. I'll let others judge whether we have met those objectives. I do ever wish to thank all of those who provided evidence to the committee, whether in formal evidence sessions, at informal meetings, in local communities or at public meetings in Hamilton, Aberdeen or Shetland. In order to assist us in our task, we appointed three advisers. They were namely Christine O'Neill to provide advice on constitutional, constitutional matters, Dr Heidi Poon dealing with taxation and Professor Nicola McEwen with regard to welfare. President Officer, I wish to put on record and that of the committee uh, for the assistance of our advisers provided us in developing this report. I would also like to put on record our thanks to our clerking team, so heavily led by Stephen Imrie. They did a fantastic job in preparing us in terms of the witnesses that were called and in helping to pull together our report. Most of all, however, I want to thank my fellow committee members for the mature, professional manner in which they approached their work. Our report has been agreed unanimously by all members of the committee. In my view, it carries far greater weight as a consequence of that. The recommendations we make are intended to be constructive and assist the UK Government in producing legislation that will implement the Smith recommendations. It's important to note, though, in certain areas, such as the devolution of air passenger duty and aggregates levy, the draft clauses do indeed meet the aims of the Smith Commission as far as the committee was concerned. But because of the time available, I have to focus on the broad areas where the committee found the draft clauses were not fit for purpose. In a wide range of areas, the committee considered that either clarification was required on the effect of a clause or that amendment was required to the clauses as currently drafted. Perhaps the most significant area we would consider that to be was on welfare. Specifically, the committee considered that the draft welfare clauses would not provide a Scottish Government with the power to, for instance, create new benefits in the areas of devolved responsibility or make discretionary payments in any area of welfare. The definitions of a carer and of disability would significantly constrain the policy autonomy of future Scottish Government in these areas. And the committee also considers that the clauses do not devolve all the powers over support for unemployed people expected by Smith. For example, 
the Access to Work programme would appear to remain reserved. We seek assurances that winter fuel payments will be devolved. And where there and whether to be a future Scottish Government introduces a new benefit or top-up, that this will not result in any offsetting of reduction in a UK benefit. Now, the interaction of devolved and reserved powers is critical across many of the Smith Commission proposals. Universal Credit provides an example of one such proposed shared power. In that light, the Committee considered that the draft clauses at 20 in brackets 4 and 21 in brackets 3 could be, could be considered or perceived to be a veto and need to be looked at again. More generally, we recommended that the principles which would inform intergovernmental working on welfare require to be placed in statute. That is a summary of our recommendations on welfare, and other members will no doubt in, want to go into more detail on these recommendations in due course. The draft welfare clauses are the area where perhaps most concerns rest because they are potentially also the most complex to implement. And I know that is an area that has been carefully scrutinised by the Welfare Reform Committee. President Officer, these clauses will impact upon some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged individuals in Scottish society. And that reminded me of a quote that Sir Harry Burns is fond of recalling of a Los Angeles priest who said to him, what we need is compassion that stands in awe at the burdens the poor have to carry, rather than stands in judgment at the way they carry it. It is therefore essential that legislation in this area not only implements the spirit and substance of Smith, but is also capable of being implemented efficiently. The taxation powers proposed for devolution by Smith will also result in a significant degree of shared power between the Scottish and UK governments. Here, the most critical elements of the operation of powers is in the areas that were not dealt with by draft clauses. Instead, the operation of these powers will be governed by a new fiscal framework, which is currently being developed. While the operation of the no detriment principle and block grant adjustment may sound esoteric, these issues are absolutely critical to the effective operation of these powers. In this area, the committee is grateful for the work that has been undertaken by the Finance Committee, who found clear differences between the Scottish and UK governments regarding the no detriment principle. Similarly, we recommend that greater clarity is required with regard to how no detriment will operate in practice. We have also made a number of detailed recommendations relating to the implementation of the taxation proposals such as how to determine what constitutes Scottish VAT, but I will leave that for others to discuss. On borrowing, the draft clauses were silent on how a new borrowing regime will operate. Accordingly, any early understanding of what borrowing powers are being devolved should be a high priority for both governments at this point. In the Committee's view, a move towards a prudential regime would provide a sensible approach. We also recommend that future Scottish Government should be able to retain any underspend in order to better manage volatility in income. Clearly, the current borrowing powers of the Scottish Government are too restrictive to cope with this new era of fiscal devolution. It is therefore imperative that the borrowing regime entered into provides genuine flexibility to future Scottish administrations. On the devolution of the Crown Estate, the the committee also expressed significant concerns. The Smith Commission could not have been clearer in their recommendations on the Crown Estate. They said, responsibility for the management of the Crown Estate economic assets in Scotland and the revenue generated from those assets will be transferred to the Scottish Parliament. However, the committee found that the draft clauses in this area would result in the creation of two Crown Estates operating in Scotland. Let me assure you, President Officer, that was a revelation was a considerable surprise to the committee, not least those members of the committee who also served on the Smith Commission. Moreover, the committee took the view that the legislative approach to devolution taken in draft clauses could be construed as being overly complex and complicated. Accordingly, the committee recommended that the UK Government should revise its approach to devolving the Crown Estate. I welcome the work now underway by the Rural Affairs Committee in this area. 
On the constitutional issues, the Committee has made recommendations that seek to strengthen the draft clauses in relation to the permanency of the Scottish Parliament. In particular, that a referendum should be held of the Scottish people if there was ever a, a suggestion that this Parliament should be de-established. We have also made recommendations in relation to the Sewell Convention, and this is an issue, as we all know, has become much more relevant given the new UK Government's plans to repeal the Human Rights Act. The proposals for further devolution will, if implemented, result in a fundamental shift in the structure of devolution, presiding officer. Lord Smith recognised the importance of intergovernmental relations in the foreword to his Commission's report. Throughout the course of the Committee's work, the importance of intergovernmental relations was a constant theme raised as a critical issue underpinning the delivery of further devolution. As a Committee, we agree with Lord Smith that the current largely non-statutory machinery of intergovernmental relations in the UK will not be sufficient to deal with the challenges arising from the proposals for further devolution. The Committee recognises that for intergovernmental relations to operate effectively, there must be space for discussions between governments to take place in confidence. However, the general principles which will underpin intergovernmental relations and dispute re resolution in future should, in the Committee's view, be placed in statute. And central to any new structure or intergovernmental relations will be the role of this Parliament and indeed Westminster in scrutinising the actions of governments within this new structure. That will pose a significant new challenge to this Parliament. And this is an area that the Committee intends to give further consideration to and thought about in the coming months. President Officer, this report is the culmination of seven months of intensive scrutiny, firstly of the Smith Commission recommendations and then of the draft legislative clauses produced by the previous UK Government. Now, I don't wish to sound conceited, it's not usually my style, on behalf of the Committee, but the sense I have is that the report has been well received by a cross-spectrum of Scottish society. And in this age of digital Parliament, let me cite two tweets in my defence. <laughs> Firstly, from a former member of the Smith Commission, Professor Adam Tompkins, who many will know well, uh, some in this chamber certainly will know well. He said, I'm quick to criticise the Scottish Parliament when it screws up, but today, today's report from the Devolution Committee is legislative scrutiny at its best. At the other end of the constitutional spectrum, Dr Andrew Tickle of the Glasgow Caledonian University, perhaps better known to some as the author of the blog Lalan's Pete Warrior, considered the committee's report to be forensic, clear, constructive, and one of the best reports he'd seen come out of Holyrood. Now, I don't make that, these points lightly. That's a message as much for this Parliament as it is for the Secretary of State for Scotland in terms of the contents of this report. It's now the ambition of all of the committee to see both the letter and spirit